Our next testifier will be Gregory Godels, and he is an author with ML Today. Marxism-Leninism Today is the electronic journal of Marxist-Leninist thought. Gregory? You got to unmute. Okay. You can hear me? Yep. Great. Um, this is a great event, and this is a needed event. I, I can't speak to how, how needed this is. In my opinion, probably the greatest obstacle to progress in our time uh, today is to overcome the twin evils of anti-communism and racism. I think they are the obstacles to our moving forward. Uh, I appreciate the invite. Um, too often when you study uh, anti-communism in the United States, it's relegated to the celebrities, the Hollywood 10 professors that were repressed or uh, liberals who were painted with the same brush and were unfairly uh, treated as though they were communist and persecuted accordingly. Very few uh, studies are devoted to the small people, the little people that in fact were communist. And um, they're often nameless victims. There were thousands, maybe 10,000s of them in the course of uh, the Cold War. Pittsburgh, where I live, uh, is an area that was hit particularly hard for several reasons. One reason because the Communist Party here had a large working class character. Um, it represented many ethnic groups and had strong black membership and leadership in the area. In addition, of course, this is a center, Pittsburgh is a center of corporate America, and that made it a particularly hot area. For that reason, a commentator like David Cott in his book, The Great Fear, the Anti-Communist Purge under Truman and Eisenhower, described Pittsburgh as the epicenter of the repression in a chapter entitled, Hell in Pittsburgh. Well, I can't name all the victims, I wish I could. Um, most are long forgotten. I did have the privilege of meeting many of those victims when I came to Pittsburgh in 1969. They suffered job losses, public shaming, the loss of friends in their relationships. Some went to jail. I can't mention more than a few, but I'd like to give you the flavor. I think their names um, should not be missing from history. Unfortunately, they, they, uh, they, they have been. One was uh, Becky Horowitz. She was a housewife. Her husband was a plumber in the Communist Party. She was petitioning on, uh, for ballot status for the Communist Party in the, in the 30s. The Pittsburgh Press, one of our then local newspapers, they competed for this kind of activity, printed the names, the addresses, and the occupations of all the petitioners. Uh, that was put in out to the public in order to um, embarrass these people. She was arrested for falsifying petitions because the authorities had then gotten people to attest that they were offered things if they would sign a petition, or they were threatened or bullied to sign a petition. The Communist Party in Western Pennsylvania decided not to contest these arrests because they did not want to embarrass or bring forth charges against the people that were making them, even though they were victimizing people. Becky, in her case, she had a, a young son in school, went to jail for six or eight months uh, based upon the, uh, this, this, this anti-communism. A couple of wonderful, wonderful people that I met when I moved here that uh, had the most integrity that I, I've ever experienced, Alan Thomas and Joseph Sonny Robinson. They both worked at Crucible Steel in Pittsburgh. They're both steel workers, both elected union officials. They had, they had things planted in their lockers. The police came in, they arrested them, they fired them, they lost their jobs. Um, they were left to find some kind of other employment. In the case of Allen, it's a funny, funny incident. He appealed this to this union. And he petitioned the union on a third occasion. They asked him if he supported the second front. If you follow World War II politics, you know the second front was when most people in this country wanted to see the US attack the Germans and form a second front 
uh, to fight the Germans when the Soviets were carrying the, the burden of the war. And of course, he says he was really for a second front in Mississippi. Uh, that went over like a lead balloon and he was not allowed to get back his job. Another old comrade was Leon Swimmer, a baker. He was a young man and along with a number of uh, progressives and communists decided they were going to integrate a pool in Pittsburgh. Pools were all, all the public pools were segregated. So they went to Highland Park, a small area in Pittsburgh, and they jumped in the pools, they were chased out. Leon was beaten, beaten badly as a consequence of this, but, but that's, it was one of the shining moments of his life in his fight. And maybe the most egregious example is Lou Bortz. He was an absolutely wonderful human being, a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, a veteran of World War II, made his living as an appliance repairman. He was called before the McCarthy hearings, not HUAC, not the House Un-American Activity Committee, but the McCarthy hearings, appeared without a lawyer, was charged with planning the assassination of Senator McCarthy. Uh, the same day he, he appeared, a Jewish American, the Rosenbergs were executed. So you can imagine the atmosphere at that time. As a result of this, of course, he lost his jobs. He tried to, uh, lost his family, alienated his friends, uh, hacked out a living. Um, these were all victims of other personalities in Pittsburgh whose names should never be forgotten. forgotten. And they were the snitches, they were the, they were the uh, informers, Harvey Matuso, Joseph Mazai, Mats Vedic. As time proceeded, as, these, as the courts generated and, and went through these, uh, these cases, they were all identified as liars, alcoholics, unreliable, and so on. But the damage was done to these people and hundreds of other people in Pittsburgh. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting them. I had the pleasure of knowing these people and they were some of the greatest people I ever met, but what they went through was unconscionable. But more unconscionable is the fact that the legacy, their legacy and the legacy of others remains uh, undefended, unnoticed, unacknowledged. I'm reminded of a Pittsburgh songwriter, folk singer that you all know, I'm sure, Ann Feeney, uh, a people singer who died recently. And she had a song, she has a song, she's dead, but she has a song about uh, where she asked, who was jailed for justice? I wish you'd written another stanza and that stanza would have been, who has been persecuted, scandalized? Who has been lost their job, lost their family, their friends? Who has been jailed uh, uh, for, for uh, and, and surveilled by the FBI? Who has an FBI number? And I'm very proud to say that having known these people, I got my own uh, FBI number, so I, I am immortalized too in the files of the FBI and proud to be. And I, I, I ask that people now, so-called progressives today, who are seeing the FBI as heroes, seeing them as heroes, revisit this era, revisit this history, and learn who the FBI really is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gregory, and it's great to see you. I, we've chatted, and I, I really love your writing on ML today. Um, Thank you. And yes, um, yeah, I'm asking you in the chat if people would do this, if you have a brief comment you want to make, if you have any stories like the last couple that we've heard, we want to hear, just get the flavor of um, McCarthyism. Uh, of course, it wasn't just in Washington, D.C. They took it on a roadshow, and it was all over uh, the United States be persecuting. I want to, I'm not sure ladies running the show, um, if you have pictures to put up right now, but in case you don't, I'm just going to, okay, good. <laughs> uh, you ladies are good. Woo. I don't even need my book, my copy. This is an amazing, amazing, uh, book. I just spent three straight what? days reading it, a conspiracy. So immense. Uh, it was one of the things that spurred me to, you know, to, to, a few of us to start this a few years ago. So it's a uh, frightening, frightening book. Um, 